Welcome to More Than Cotton, Textile Secrets of Kew's Economic Botany Collection with Dr. Mark Nesbitt. Success as, as a, a practical tool, but in the 19th century, it simply meant uh, practical or useful. So the Economic Botany Collection is the descendant of Kew's Museum of Economic Botany, Museum of Useful Plants is the best way to think about it. Now I'll talk in a moment about why Kew has this collection. But I've just pulled out a few objects here to show you what does the Economic Botany Collection look like. What it looks like is plant raw materials and things made from plants. So what you might see at the Pitt Rivers Museum or the British Museum is generally finished objects. What you'll see at Kew is the you know, for example, the timber with the wooden objects is made from the block of rubber that these rubber objects, the pipe and the jewellery and the comb are uh, made from. You'll find uh, the cotton ball, in this instance, uh, collected by David Livingston on the Zambezi uh, expedition. You'll find the tea flowers uh, from Vietnam. You'll find a tray of medicinal plants used for training pharmacists in, in the 19th century. So it's that, that connects a raw material and finished product that's so distinctive and makes it I think such an important resource uh, for textile research. So I think there's a small pause on my computer and moving to the next screen. Let me press the button more firmly to try and avoid the cascade effect in which uh, countless pages and turn. There we go. I think best will work. Um, so we estimate there are roughly 2,600 plant fibre related materials in, in the collection. That includes some animal fibres, and we'll, we'll come to those later, um, including around about 800 textile samples, 500 ropes and strings, uh, and then a, a huge array of other things. That number is, is probably out of date. I don't think it takes account of the 500 or so raw fibres that we recently received from the Imperial Institute which shut in 1960, um, and the fibres were passed on to another research institute that quite recently found their home at Kew. So it's a constantly growing collection. It's very diverse. It has so these are some family names, Malvaceae, that's the cotton family, Urticaceae, that's nettles and rami, uh, Tiliaceae lime, that's lime fibres, I think that's jute as well, the cacao family, the, the mulberry family, paper mulberry, we'll come to that later as well, Asclepia daceae, that's milkweeds, so really diverse in its content. So again, perhaps different to the fibre collection you might find in a textile research institute, but probably concentrate more on the major fibres. And all plant parts represented, the, the inner bark, uh, leaves, we'll come to those, uh, seed hairs, as in the case of cotton. And the collection is also rich in dyes, with a placement student just starting on Monday, who is researching our dye collection, uh, and in the tools associated with making uh, and processing fibres, everything from carding tools through to, to portable looms. Now, uh, why did you build up this connection, collection? But if you think about uh, strategic materials, raw materials, undoubtedly the most important raw material of the 20th century was oil. And, you know, countries went to war on the strength of that. Uh, economies grew and boomed and failed on the back of that. Uh, that wasn't true in the 19th century. All the things that we Made, used today that are made from oil, uh, fibres indeed, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, plastics, uh, were made from plants in the 19th century. So not only food and, and clothing, uh, medicines, plastics, timber, rubber, uh, 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 rubber as a plastic substitute and so on. Um, and, and this is really what fueled the, the British Industrial Revolution. Britain has very few natural resources of its own. It's got water, it's got iron ore, it's got coal, it's got grass. These are all very useful things. But if you want to be a major manufacturing country, you are going to rely on raw materials coming in from around the world. Uh, and this is the context in which Sir William Hooker came to Kew uh, as director 
1841, uh, succeeded by his son, Sophia Zapuka, succeeded by his son-in-law, that's William Hustleton Dyer, great family dynasty. And William Hooker arrived as a derelict cube that had been uh, empty for 20 years uh, since the death of Joseph Banks and George III in, in 1820. And he was tasked with you know, turning it into his, his vision of a major uh, scientific research institution and botanic garden. And that needed government money. So how do you get government money? You show how you're delivering uh, government objectives. It's exactly the same way that Q works very closely with the Department for the Environment with, with DEFRA uh, today. Uh, now, the middle of the 19th century is a very interesting time in imperial history. It's a time of centralization of control from London uh, after the colonies have responded so badly uh, to the abolition of slavery in terms of implementing that. Uh, events soon after, such as the Indian Mutiny, showed that a strong hand from London was, was needed. Um, and so this is a point at which Q comes on the scene, British industry is thriving, and there's more central control from London. So William Hooker positions Q as the, if you like, the knowledge centre that sits between the producers of raw materials around the world, often in far away remote and places are very poorly known to Western botanists, let alone Western industrialists, uh, and manufacturers and consumers in, in Britain. And so the, this museum, the, the picture here shows the world's first museum of economic botany, opened in 1847, um, was uh, eventually grew to fill four buildings, as I'll show on the, on the Kew site. They had these two functions, one as a, uh, a materials library, and current day speak, that'd be familiar to some of you, uh, as somewhere that uh, people could come buy the guidebooks, one for each museum, and learn botany and learn uses of plants as they walked around the museum in a very systematic way. And we know that the museum was used for that purpose. Uh, the museum had a really important role in answering questions of industry, and that led to some really major events, such as the transfer of rubber from South America to Asia. Um, but it was also a public space, really popular with visitors. And William Booker complains that he finds it hard to take in his own visitors, because these buildings so full of colour in a, a rather drab London of the second half of the 19th century, uh, these are very popular uh, places to come. Uh, he was very clear about his objectives to collect all kinds of useful and curious, not really useful, but also interesting vegetable products. Uh, the target audience, the scientific botanist, the merchant, manufacturer, the physician, the druggist, the dyer, artisans of every description. Uh, and he saw it as part of a wider botanical complex where you'd have the living plants, um, you would have the herbarium and the library, if you like the science part of the gardens, and the museum, and not least as a really important resource as somewhere for people to visit uh, in winter. And we're very lucky that a Dutch botanist visited Kew in 1902 and took a picture of one of your cases, so we know exactly what these look like. All of these cases are now empty, the building's still there, uh, but the contents were moved into a purpose-built store in the 1980s, and that's where we carry out research today. And you can see here, this is a case of palms, but you've got the male and female flowers of the farm, you've got photographs showing the plant its natural habitat, we've got along the bottom a long thin stick, that's a walking stick, uh, both a, a raw walking stick and a finished walking stick made from the young uprooted palm, you've got various products in the glass jars, you've got a botanical illustration, so it's very multimedia, so what you have to imagine is that the objects are going to show you didn't sit in you know, cardboard boxes as they do now. They sat with many other objects. And with all of those stages, uh, what the Victorians called the illustrative series, uh, a way of, dis of display used at exhibitions and museums that takes you from the raw material to the finished product, from a lump of coal and iron ore at the beginning of a display case to the railway engine at the upper end. And from the 1860s onwards, this was the dominant method of display in Victorian museums, and a very powerful way uh, of showing how things are made, how raw materials are transformed. Uh, so the museum grew in 1857 uh, to uh, 
the, the uh, building opposite the Palm House, some of you will know, the Botanical Cafe now on the ground floor. And in fact, you can see a textile link there, but the big object displayed in the center is a model of an indigo factory. I have a PhD student working on the revival of indigo dyes in Bengal as we speak, just packing her bags and ready to head off to India. It grew to the orangery, some of you know some of the other cafes there, where a huge range of tropical timbers, but also other tropical products on display. Um, uh, and the Wood Museum as well. This is a very influential uh, model. It, spread into school museums, Q often supplied material to uh, no, primary schools, state primary schools, to make displays uh, such as this often associated with Empire Day, but talking about that connection between raw materials and manufacturers. Uh, the Swiss Cottage Museum, uh, built for Queen Victoria's children at uh, Osborne House, is replete with uh, uh, economic botany, including lots of textiles. I think around about a sixth of the collection there is botanical. Um, and you see Jamaican lace spark. We'll come back to that later in the black and white picture there. That's from the Swiss, Swiss Cottage Museum. And internationally, we've identified 50 or 60 such museums, all sometimes literally modelled on Kew. The Missouri Botanic Garden Museum, which has just reopened, uh, is exactly the same size and design as the Kew Museum. Uh, the Indian Museum in Calcutta, the fantastic Museum of Economic Botany in Adelaide Botanic Garden, the Harvard Museum, which is now in store up in the attics. And from the 1950s onwards, these collections had a very rough time. Uh, they were seen as cluttered and old-fashioned displays, uh, natural materials, as those of you of a certain age will remember, um, really went out of fashion in, in, in the 60s. I remember Raymond Baxter on television extolling the virtues of plastic houses as, as the way of the, the future. And so, you know, plants and clutter went really out of fashion in museum terms. And it's been very encouraging for me to see how in the last 15 years, both the research potential of these collections when they haven't been destroyed, as many were, uh, and the uh, public engagement possibilities really coming back to life. So now we're going to move on to uh, a sort of series of vignettes of the contents of the uh, collection. We're starting a plant that many of you will know, New Zealand Black, so Harakeke, uh, two species uh, of Formium. Uh, and now we know from historical records that the uh, fiber plant repertoire of Maori people in the, say, the middle of the 19th century was very wide, encompassed perhaps 20 or 25 or 30 species. And through you know, forced assimilation, forced migration, a lot of those have dropped out of the standard repertoire of Maori weaving. But New Zealand flax has always uh, held good um, and remains important today. And, uh, one of the great resources for that is the work of Rennie Orchison, shown here, who rescued a lot of the land races, the traditional varieties, each of which has different properties at a point in the 1960s and 1970s when they had become very vulnerable. Uh, so you can see here the use in, in ceremonial dress, dress that's linked a lot to rites of passage, uh, but it's made by, by, by expert uh, craftspeople, by artisans, uh, sells for high prices, a really important industry in terms of bringing money into women uh, makers' uh, hands. And some of the uh, 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 equipment uh, in the in the collection, the uh, oyster shell or mussel shell, I think, that's traditionally used for scraping out the fibres from inside the leaves. And the leaves can either be cut into strips and used plaited, or you can extract these wonderful white fibres from inside them. As my found my young daughter, which is about five, out in my garden, uh, stripping out the fibres from the leaves, she worked out how to do it herself. Uh, and we have indeed Maori uh, samples uh, collected in this case by the Reverend uh, Colenso, one of the great uh, uh, figures of uh, early New Zealand history, really important ethnobotanist uh, and collector, uh, really embedded in Maori communities. But then we also have 
what is in many ways the raison d'etre of the collection, which is these, uh, the idea that it's a giant bioprospecting machine. It's a way of surveying the plants of the world and working out what can be sucked and drawn into the Victorian manufacturing industry. And New Zealand Flats is a really important example of exactly such a plant. Uh, grown on industrial scale in, in New Zealand right up to the 1960s but with heavy government subsidies up to that end period. Uh, uh, grown in St Helena, uh, where in the Atlantic, where it's become a tremendous invasive plant and a real problem. Um, and you can see here the adaptation of machinery for stripping out the, the fibers. And we have a whole range in, in the collection of uh, industrial uh, products, uh, carpeting and, and so on. And I'm really pleased that uh, Deidre Brown, at the University of Auckland, who is an indigenous a uh, scholar, um, we were able to support her in studying our Harakeke collection. Uh, during uh, lockdown, she was able to fund the PhD student body events to come from Bristol and document the collection and a photographer to come and photograph everything so that we can send it and Deidre can work remotely on the collection. What's also really exciting for me is the way that she's working for collection is not uh, focusing only on the indigenous objects which are really important but are well represented in other museums but it's also looking at that transition into industrial production and sometimes that, that's side gets a bit neglected by scholars. We're really keen to encourage researchers to take a holistic view of the collection, as in fact was intended by its founders. Um, in contrast, the plant that didn't make it through to industrialization was Tikumu, uh, Salmisia semicordata. It's a really attractive uh, alpine plant from the mountains of the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, you can see it growing in the alpine beds at Kew. It's in the daisy family, uh, so it has the rosette of leaves as you would expect to see in the daisy plant. Uh, and yet there's something special about these leaves, but they're long and strap-like. And that's usually a feature that you only find what botanists call the monocots the monocotyledons, things like grasses and, and palms have long leaves. Now, most uh, other plants like oaks and roses have short stubby leaves. And this property was noticed, of course, by Maori weavers, um, uh, who or furthermore discovered that there are two species of Somesia. Uh, and I know that one of our, our listeners today was involved in publishing this uh, really exciting work in which you can peel off the upper surface of the leaf. So you're simply left with the fuzzy undersurface which is a, a network of fibers, it's very rain resistant. Uh, and you can then, from that, uh, make a cloak. So in the case of the cloak you see here on the right, this is a Harakeke, a New Zealand flax cloak, uh, covered uh, on the exterior with these the fluffy undersurfaces of the leaves. So really great uh, rain repellent, but also very beautiful. As you can see on this cloak of Q, which is made entirely from Takumu, apart from the coloured strips of New Zealand flax. Uh, you can see it's made, so this uh, cloak was uh, conserved by a Luba Dogger nurse, a fantastic conservator trained at the Textile Conservation Centre in Glasgow, working in consultation with Maori Weavers resident in, in London uh, and by email with, with New Zealand. Uh, and they were working together, able to work out how the cloak was made uh, to identify the technical difficulty of weaving a cloak from rolled up leaves, this is the main raw material, and then stitching in every three centimeters or so these rows of uh, leaves that are hanging down. And these are all just the fuzzy undersurface of the leaves. That's why it's still soft and it's still golden today. These sort of dark green upper stiff parts of the leaves were removed and thrown away uh, before manufacture. And this was collected by Walter Mantell in 1858, who started as a land agent, started by buying Maori land in the cheap, uh, was disgusted by what he saw, became an MP and a really fervent campaigner for Maori rights, whose work remains today actually in ongoing legal cases around land uh, in, in New Zealand. Um, and this is a really good case of working with conservation. Most objects in the collection are in relatively good condition. We're very lucky to be a creator of, of plant materials, primarily cellulose, long chain carbohydrates, it's relatively stable, unlike the poor creators of things like feathers, maybe 
keratin, uh, animal products are far less stable uh, in storage. Uh, but in this case, the, the, of the, the cloak didn't need intervention, it didn't need repair, but it was previously folded up because its purpose in the museum was simply so you could make things from these leaves. It was not to display the richness of Maori culture. And what Luba's work and the new packaging that she's made for the cloak has done is enable the cloak to tell its own story and the story of the Maori experts who worked on the project as well uh, for the first time in you know, 170 years or so. So, uh, but I would say Somisa, by the way, was never commercialized. There was no way you could take that into, into commerce. Um, so uh, looking at more kinds of, of textiles. So uh, looking at leaves from the monocots that I was talking about, from the sort of pineapple uh, family, uh, argan or peter silk grass is one of a, a quite a large number of fibers that are extracted from tropical plants uh, in this uh, plant family. And you can see the manual process of extraction that's often done with machinery uh, taking place in Panama here. And argan or pita is connected to a really fascinating story that I helped a New Zealand scholar unpick uh, a few years ago around the obsession with uh, fibers and artificial silks in, in the 19th century. And for two reasons, really, from a, a consumer end. So this is the time before rayon, before nylon. Uh, and so if you wanted fancy materials, you were really going to go to silk, which is very expensive and came from very far away. Uh, so there was a lot of interest in substitutes for silk. Uh, but equally, it came from the producing end. But uh, colonies were expected to be self-sustaining, they were expected to export cash crops. Um, uh, uh, but in many cases, colonies really struggled uh, to be successful in those exports. They needed things that could be easily grown, that could actually be processed. A real issue for these monocot leaves that have very tough fibers in, you have to import machinery to process them. Uh, and then you have to be sure that when they get to the market in London, but uh, 50 other countries haven't had the same idea at the same time and flooded the market. So we have a lot of documentation trying to probing, if you like, the potential fibers of Q, uh, often uh, unsuccessfully. And this leads to the wonderful short story by, by Joseph Conrad, the planter of Malata. Malata is an imaginary island in, in the Pacific. And Anne Lane was the literary historian who, who researched this uh, about uh, 20 years ago on my very first project I worked on in the collection. Uh, and she was intrigued as to what the imaginary plant was that the planter was growing. I should say the planter comes to a bad end as so many comrade characters do. And she finds a, a very interesting alignment with the promotion of argan at almost exactly at the same time as the short story has been written in, in 1914. But a character called Henry Wickham, very familiar from the rubber story, uh, claimed um, with with some problems to his claim uh, to have been foundational in the, the uh, beginnings of the rubber industry uh, in Malaysia, um, a, a chronically untruthful character, I fear, um, became involved in uh, a company that was going to bring argan into cultivation from South America, from Colombia, uh, bring it into colonial plantations, uh, produce artificial salt from it, make a lot of money. And you can see here there was a, a meeting at which um, Henry Wickham's name is, is very prominent. He was one of the directors uh, of a company. And this uh, company went bust uh, in 1922 uh, with 100,000 pounds of capital completely lost. And this is a common story in the fibers industry at the time. Uh, and here are two of these other silk substitutes that people investigated. Uh, K-pop, many of you will know. But the tricky thing with a lot of these seed hairs, as these are, is that they don't interlock. They're very hard to weave anything from uh, because they don't stick together. Whereas if you've ever seen uh, a scanning electron micrograph of cotton, you will notice that cotton fibers, which are also seed hairs, uh, they twist. And that, therefore, when you weave them, they, they grip each other. That's why cotton is such a fantastically uh, successful textile fiber. 
Uh, so it's promised to talk about animal products. Now, why are there animal products in the economic marketing collection? And I have never found any written statement on this, but I have noticed. Uh, but it really it's about animal products that come from eating a particular plant. So we don't have wool because sheep eat everything, but we do have a shellac and lac because lac insects live on particular Indian trees, and we do have silk because uh, the different silkworms live on particular plants, in this case on the castor oil uh, plant in, in India. Uh, and this, um, here you can see the raw materials and the tools that I talked about. So this is known as tussa silk. Uh, it was a subject of a lot of investigation by the dye maker who supplied William Morris, uh, based in Leek in Staffordshire. His name uh, escapes me right at the moment, but many of you will know who I'm talking about. There's a wonderful exhibition at the William Morris uh, Museum a few years ago uh, of his work. And it was he who worked out the technique where if you treated the surface of tussle silk uh, with acid, you could get it to, to really take up uh, Western dyes and produce uh, you know, extraordinary iridescent uh, uh, silks. Um, and we have those in the collection as well. But in this case, I'm going to uh, illustrate ND cloth made by the Meaches of the Sikkim Lowlands, of Northern India, the cocoons of the castor oil plant silkworm, so a very specific silkworm, much used in Sikkim, Nepal, and Bhutan, uh, collected by Dr. Campbell in the 1850s. Uh, and the photograph doesn't do beauty, so there's a depth, the, the color, uh, really beautiful, beautiful uh, textile. Uh, moving on to lace and a really unusual uh, collection of lace made from the stem fibers, the bast fibers of different garden plants. In this case, a combination of sting net or Solomon seal and garden nasturtium. Uh, this is part of a set of material, including bog oak, uh, given to Kew in the 1850s by the Countess of Donorell, a very pleasant little uh, town and lovely house uh, near Cork. Um, um, as often, if you think about the timing of that, a bit just after the potato famine, uh, this is part of wider relief efforts and the um, idea of creating high value crafts, an idea that keeps coming back, uh, uh, I have to say, as in the past, varying degrees of success, um, but with, with support local livelihoods. Um, and so this is a, a wonderful collection, it includes a sweet pea lace here. Again, because we're economic botany collection, we have hanks of the raw material, the fibers extracted from the lace, as well as the lace itself, a honeysuckle lace, uh, really uh, magical and beautiful collection. But that tradition of making lace from garden plants uh, did, did not catch on, it did not survive. Uh, moving on then to another plant product, another bast fiber, in fact. Uh, we're going to look at Jama Jamaican lace plant, the ghetto, the ghetto. And I was going to say at the beginning that you know, the economic botany collection contains about 100 pounds. Uh, things. And so it would be fair to say that my knowledge is uh, broad but extremely shallow. I know a little bit about most parts of the collection, and in particular, enough to work out where projects might lie if we're talking to a PhD student or to a, histor a design historian or, or a maker. Um, but I have one or two pockets of knowledge, and one of them is about Jamaican place spark, and we can easily spend the whole afternoon talking about that. But I should just very briefly say um, that this is a really remarkable material. There's only two species of tree that can do this, so one in Jamaica, one in New Zealand, uh, where the phloem tubes make up the inner bark, the soft bark that sits underneath the corky outer bark, are interconnected in such a way in multiple layers that when you tease it apart with your hands, you get vast amounts of natural lace, beautiful lace, uh, un unraveling. And don't be misled by the Victorian pollution on this festival, it completes this and make it a very, very attractive material. And I was really prompted to research this by Emily Brennan, another conservator, another example of a conservator bring objects to life, as in the case of this uh, beautiful bonnet here from Jamaica uh, from the 1850s, where everything you see except for the red ribbon is Jamaican lace spark. And Emily started asking lots of questions like conservators always do that we couldn't answer. 
And this led her on to an uh, undergraduate dissertation, master's dissertation, uh, a PhD, and to contacts of a wonderful Jamaican scholar, uh, Steve Cluckbridge in the United States, who's written a sort of standard book now on the spark, mostly based on the Pew collections. Um, and you can see a range of beautiful objects here. We have uh, slippers, uh, cordage, whips, this fan, where the sort of backdrop is uh, made out of lace spark. And Emily was able to visit the maroon country in the centre of Jamaica, where lace spark was traditionally harvested. And Derek Lemon, the great expert on, on lace spark in the maroon community, was able to harvest uh, some for her. Now, I say was because uh, two things hammered the fate of lace spark. One, it's a wild tree, and therefore, like most wild plants, it's very susceptible to over harvesting. Uh, and we see reports about 10 years after uh, tourist ships start arriving in Boston and Jamaica, bringing tourists one way and bananas the other way, uh, reports that it's coming hard to find the lace spark tree. Then the other is the arrival of plastics in the 1960s and decimation of Jamaican crafts. So there's been constant interest in, in reviving this craft, a very distinctive Jamaican tradition, uh, but really depend on bring it into sustainable, probably, cultivation. Uh, and colleagues of us at Missouri Botanic Garden and the Institute of Jamaica are currently the early stages of work on that very subject, working back with, with Derek. And you can see here one well, of my students, Kim Walker at Buckingham Palace uh, for a Commonwealth Forestry event, uh, where we put out a very nice display of the spark for the Queen and Prince Philip and the High Commissioner of Jamaica. And this is a slow burning project, but it's one that I hope will take place. Uh, I talked about the Mulberry family uh, earlier, um, really a quite major area that I've been working on for the last few years is on uh, Jamaican lace bar. And this is the last part that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and there are a number of plants in the Mulberry family, but you can, um, so breadfruit, for example, a fig, and paper mulberry, a cousin of the mulberry tree, uh, where the inner bark, uh, the best fibers, are strong enough uh, and interlocked in the right way, but they can be beaten into bark cloth. And you can see that process in the photograph here. Um, uh, you coppice the trees, you can see uh, a bunch of trees, harvested trees being held at the bottom there. When they're about two years old, the bark is still very soft and quite narrow. You cut it off the tree, you take you know, roughly two inch wide strip and you beat it into a strip six inches wide and then you glue that and beat it into other strips to make pieces uh, up to two miles long, uh, in the case of, of Tonga, uh, really substantial pieces of tapagos. So it's, this is the textile of Polynesia before missionaries arrived, before traders arrived, woven cloths from Manchester. And I'll just say it's very important to Polynesian culture, it's very symbolically laden. But over time, some islands have kept up the tradition, uh, such as Tonga and Samoa, and others such as Tahiti and Hawaii lost it, but have been reviving it as a high value, uh, high craft art form. Uh, and here's an example, uh, some backgrounds of the material in the collection, a really important collection of 1869. Prince Alfred, the younger son of Queen Victoria, visited Tahiti and Hawaii, hosted large parties of the local royal families. There's a lot of gift giving and tapa bark cloth is a very symbolic material, especially if you've worn it and give it to someone else who wears it. Uh, really important in, in gift giving. And those collections are still at and have been quite recently rediscovered and, and reassessed. And they were shown on return at South Kensington Museum, the BNA, uh, and then passed on to Kew and then distributed by Kew to other museums, where we've been gradually finding pieces such as the sister of our wonderful hibiscus uh, headdress uh, here at Kew. And here are some of the pieces uh, from Tahiti, the wonderful uh, punche like boot garment. To put her here, the neck hole, um, two of those, one with the cuticles of, I think, sugarcane leaves dangling off at rustle uh, when you dance. The yellow tapa cloth dyed with turmeric, uh, then Hawaiian uh, sleeping uh, sheets here. Um, 
really uh, amazing material. And what's odd about this collection, as the art historians will tell you, that tapper making stopped in Tahiti and Hawaii by the middle of the 19th century. Yet when the British royal family turned up in 1869, huge amounts of, frankly for us, very well dated, very well provenance tapper uh, turn up, misleading something of a reassessment of a history of Barkov in Polynesia. And we were able to develop this work through an Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, working with the Textile Conservation Centre now at Glasgow, uh, working with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, and of course with uh, Q, and bringing together the skills of botany, of technical art history. So you see the little graph there showing the use of uh, chemistry to distinguish the fibres of breadfruit, pig, and paper mulberry, something that's almost impossible, or perhaps impossible, to do by microscopy a real breakthrough, I would say that that result, uh, working with makers in uh, New Zealand, uh, in Hawaii, in the Cook Islands. So bringing together technical art history, botany, art history, museum studies, uh, local communities uh, and makers. And we think that approach worked really well. Uh, it's led to a major book, Reassessing History of Polynesian Barclough, download that free online uh, and a wonderful website uh, where you can investigate our museum collections, the plants, the processes, the history, the tools uh, that are involved. And I really chose that as my uh, last slide um, to make the point that I think there's an opportunity to do similar studies uh, with dyes and with plant fibers. There are good um, highly focused studies often centered on very particular museum collections or museum objects. Um, but if you want to find out about the, particularly if you're going outside the major fibers, you want to find out about the so-called orphan crops or underutilized or locally important fibers. Uh, you want to know what are their properties as fresh fibers, what are their properties as they age, um, how were they processed, uh, where can you get them now, um, how were they used, how they stood up to time, what are the implications for conserv conservation, what are the implications for commodity history, that information is extraordinarily difficult to find. So I do think there is scope for bigger projects, bringing together a range of collaborators that attempt to answer some of these questions for textile plants as a whole. Thank you very much. And you're muted. Philippa, Philippa, you're muted. Sorry, I was unmuted. Um, I was trying to speak to you, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was just going to ask you, um, is it possible to go and see the collection? Um, or do you have to make an appointment? So the, the collection has one member of staff, the wonderful Erin Messenger. Um, uh, we do in pre-COVID times, we hosted about 500 people a year. We we couldn't do it actually, it, it exhausted us, but we still love bringing people into the collection. So what we say is you need to make an appointment, you need to be either a researcher, that absolutely doesn't mean you need to be an institution, but it does mean you need to have a specific research question that seeing our collections help you with. We won't quiz you on that, but we will, you will need to say what you're going to see out of those hundred thousand boxes. We, we need you to specify. Uh, and we also host special interest groups. So we've hosted, for example, the Textile Society have been in the past to see something that I didn't show you actually, Jenny Balfour Paul's wonderful indigo collection um, and many of the wonderful things that are at Q from that. Um, so we can cope with visits and special interest groups and we cope with visitors from researchers and we lend. So if you went to the fabric of India or fashion from nature at the BNA, you will have seen our collections there. And it, presumably everything you have is catalogued and that is um, available to see, is it? Yes, yeah, so if yeah. you just Google Economic Botany Q or go to that link, um, you can find our catalogue. It's not, it's not super user friendly uh, and we're still working on adding photographs. It, it will become better. Um, but if you know how to search by Latin names, it's an effective way of searching the collection. Right, right, okay. Um, Jane, were you looking through? 
Yes. Um, hi. Uh, so thanks so much, Mark. Um, you have a real appreciation society on the chat at the moment. Okay. Um, and um, I'm just, um, there is a question, a uh, few questions on this. Um, uh, one is that uh, from Ellie, uh, she says, why the bast, why are the bast fibres not popular in making conventional textile products? So maybe you'd like to sort of qualify that maybe she meant this particular bust fiber well i think uh yes so so perhaps um the sort of classic inner bark uh fibers the tree fibers you know rather than your hemp and, and your linen and so on and i think that's a good question but uh, we've been looking at actually, particularly with regard to paper making, because uh, we have a very fine collection of Japanese paper at Kew, it's also made from paper mulberry, and which was collected with the idea that paper mulberry might be a good raw material in the 1860s at a time of raw material shortages in, in the UK. And as you know, paper was made from recycled linen and hemp, there's a strong textile connection there. Uh, and the conclusion of one master's projects looked at that so far uh, was that the material was simply too different it, it, it you couldn't break it up into fibers and, and it didn't wouldn't behave in the same way as linen or cotton uh, and so it wasn't adopted by British industry and eventually of course wood fiber came in and, and completely new systems were were developed to handle that um, I think we sometimes underestimate the prevalence of bark cloth. And it's not only important in Polynesia, it was important in South America, it's mostly disappeared, important in parts of uh, India, still very important in Uganda because of its ceremonial connection. In fact, it's used for uh, crowning a king or a chief, for example. Um, so I think it, it's a bit of a forgotten material, but it is one that hasn't, that you can buy Ugandan bark cloth. There's a company in Germany that treats it so you can use it for furniture, for example. Um, you know, I think essentially if it's a polymer, probably uh, onto it. But it's not something that slides easily in. But I think there is a bigger history of design question there. It's a very good question around what happens when new materials arrive. And in some cases, like rubber, uh, it's picked up incredibly quickly by industry, but it's, it's very different to anything that was available to Victorian manufacturers before vulcanization. Now, within 10 years, and more or less instantly after the Crystal Palace exhibition, where both Macintosh and Goodyear showed their collections, is widely adopted by manufacturers. But no historian of design has looked at that process. So I think there's lots of interesting questions about the commodity industry interface that are not being looked at at the moment. Okay, th thank you. Maybe it needs another big exhibition to, to, to help promote it. Um, sorry, I credited the wrong person. That question was from Raj. The next question, though, is, is from Ellie, and she says, do you have anything in the collection in relation to Madras cloth? You did show a very nice sample of that. Have you got anything within the collection um, relating to that in queue? I'm not sure. I would have to look on, on the database uh, for that. I invite okay. you to have a look. And the database is, of course, um, uh, available to the public, isn't it, to delve yes, into the yeah, yeah. Yes, OK. And um, also, uh, just uh, quickly, do you have any examples in the collection of UK grown flax? Yes, lot, lots, yes. Um, so it's quite a good flax collection. Um, including one or two quite charming objects like the whole kit showing how flax is made produced in the 1930s for marketing flax uh, into schools. Um, so it's absolutely not just an overseas collection. It's quite hard to get people to study the British material, um, but or the European material indeed, but there are really in interesting stories there. Oh, oh okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, I've kind of got, um, if, if people don't mind, I've got a, um, a question which, which relates to that. Um, you, you mentioned about accessing knowledge to um, the properties. Um, and I was sort of thinking about this, you showed the grass linen skirt and, um, and everything, and also the Polynesian um, cloths as well, the bark cloths. It would be really interesting and relevant for both industry and education to be able to have access 
to, um, to those properties. But I also wondered, um, what was your thinking um, in the modern day? Because we, we are so concerned with, with plants across the world. Um, what's your thinking in how um, manufacturers, and I include crafters in that, small, small people as well as large industry, could actually play a dual role in helping to conserve plants as well as perhaps experiment and, and get to know these plants better through yourselves. Um, and what's your thinking on that? Is there, a, is there a distant relationship? Could it be closer? No, I think that that's a really important point and it, it raises one or two other questions as well. Um, so we know that the best guarantee for preserving a plant is its use. And New Zealand flats and all of these wonderful indigenous varieties is a really good example of that. Um, but you know, it wasn't actually just the efforts of one person that led to this fiber of that collection. It's the fact that it's widely used that needs New Zealand land care to fund it and to, to support it uh, today. Um, if you, you know, look at like, things like British apples and so on against people seeking out these varieties in order to grow them, but keep these varieties in uh, hanging on just about in, in cultivation. Uh, uh, so I think you know, when you're looking at crops, there is perhaps a distinction between, and we see some food crops, things like wheat and barley, but are simply global crops, so jute, cotton. These will look after themselves. They have major research institutes. They've been grown around the world for a long time. And then what in other contexts often called orphan crops, but it includes wild plants too, but they're often tied much more to their locality and where the hope is to create development that leads to, let us say, cultivation and conservation taking place in that locus where the plant originates and therefore where the money goes back into the communities that husband did those plants through time. Uh, and that if plants are moved and taken to cultivation elsewhere, today that's done with the permission of the communities and with the financial feedback uh, from that. Uh, so you know, so general principle of ethnobotany uh, today, as we talked about at the beginning, is that it should be led by the community right, rather, uh, and that so if you are going to work in developing textiles, it's not about taking a development project somewhere, it's about working with communities to understand their needs and how those can be most uh, effectively met. Um, but I would say so at the moment, the kind of supply chain for uh, local fibers is, is you know, it's quite erratic. Um, you know, if it doesn't get into you know, one or two of these wonderful shops in, in London, uh, you're you're looking on eBay or you're emailing producers. Um, you know, they're difficult to get hold of and they're often an uncertain source. Uh, I think just to wrap up the answer to that question before I speak too long, that what we know from other plant products like timber, uh, food and medicine is that traceability is absolutely key to everything. It's, it's key to good labour practices, to sustainability, uh, to conservation. And that uh, when we're thinking about these local uh, textile fibres, traceability and the connection back to place is really important. Thank you. We have got a couple of other, other questions on here, which I'm sure you can deal with briefly. I just did want to ask you, I don't want to be indulgent, but I did want to ask you about this. You mentioned sugarcane and turmeric. I just wondered um, whether or not there is a fibre use, a textile fibre use with sugarcane because turmeric is used. That would is there at all or has there ever been? No, I mean, the turmeric is used as a dye yeah. and these cuticles from sugarcane are so fine that I don't, you can, they're used there for adornment. We, okay. we don't fully understand how the, I don't think anyone has in recent times replicated their production. And I have heard from a maker who visited that they may not be from sugarcane at all. Um, so it needs further uh, investigation. Uh, and this was, of course, a big effort in the 19th century, is finding out exactly what plant did things come from in, in the sort of Western uh, taxonomic system, because once you know the species of something, that is a key to a whole lot more uh, information. 
And today I'd say we probably do know the species for most textile fibres, but our understanding of, for example, locally selected varieties and the different properties of those varieties is still very incomplete. Okay, we've got um, a, a couple, so you know that you're not working in a, a silo in queue. Uh, a few people who have been following the Indigo project, um, obviously really important with the, with the denim industry, perhaps, and uh, there seems to be an ongoing um, project in Scotland, which I think may come onto this very important question, which is um, from, are you, is it, I don't know if it's from, from, from you, Philippa or Janet, are you able to monitor changes in fibres and plants as climate changes? <laughs> yeah, that um, me, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it, uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm sure that, that work is not being done at Kew. We're looking at other aspects of our plants and their pests respond to climate change. But I'm very confident in the wider world of textiles, at least for the big textile plants like cotton, that, that work is ongoing. Uh, and one of the ways in which, again, not with textile plants and coffee, for example, but we worked on that at Kew is not only looking at the crop plant, but looking at the wild relatives where the genes are often sitting that will be useful for adapting to climate change. And so that means if you are looking at textile plants, from that point of view, you need to actually also be looking at what was the wild ancestor of that textile plant, and where are its wild relatives today, and are they being looked after? Are they going to be there in 10 or 20 years' time when new plant breeding programs are required? Okay, mm, and I, I just th there is also, um, just, to, just to flag it up in case people haven't seen it, uh, so, so, um, Freya Lynn has um, said that there's an ongoing project in Scotland on our linen stories, so, so people just might like to make a note of that. We're talking a lot about flax. Mm. Um, Philippa, I don't, I think that's gone through. That's the going through all, yes. Yes, does anybody else have any questions? Janet, I think you had something, didn't you? That um, Just maybe one. I, I was fascinated by the Jamaican lace bark. <laughs> it looked amazing. Um, how do they construct that into something for textile use? Do they use a construction process or is it like the bark cloth and just sort of matted together? So it's actually ready for use as, as you un un unraveled it. We, we, we don't, again, we, because it hasn't been made for such a long time, we not only know very little about harvesting, we know very little about the making beyond what we can observe working back from the objects uh, and some of the sort of half-made or uh, half-processed pieces. But as far as I can tell, you know, you need to do some bleaching, some repairs, some sewing together of patches, but it is very, very light touch, the, the processing. Thank you. So are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask now before? We lose Mark, which would be a shame. Um, I'm sure I had some, but I can't, I think it was, I was just curious about climate change, certainly. Can, can I just get one in then, Philippa? And that is, um, what, what was the relationship between the Polynesian bark cloths and Manchester? Because Manchester has been very important for, for cotton. Uh, essentially, as soon as cotton cloth appeared in the Pacific, the women who did all the beating for the bark cloth said, wow, we don't need to spend eight hours a day beating bark cloth, and they adopted woven cloth instead. And, and as part of a wider pattern of, of you know, loss of cultural traditions. Um, uh, uh, so, so no, it's not a, no, no, I don't think people were forced to adopt woven cloth, but the fact is that bark cloth is extremely laborious to make, does involve a lot of beating. And so there was a natural market for woven cloth when it appeared. So it wasn't bark cloth wasn't ever it wasn't nothing was ever exported over to the UK and 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 beaten up as such in the factory. No, no, no. no. OK, thank you. There is one last question that's just come up. Oh, and another one. Um, uh, Jess 
Kirkpatrick asks, who would be the best contact about visiting dye collections at Kew? I mean, is that possible to contact somebody? To yes, yeah, so I put up an email address, but maybe too briefly at the end. I'm putting it in the chat bar to everyone now, ekbot at kew.org. That reaches the very small team that looks after the collection. So just, just email your questions. Uh, so I... I you know, for this talk, I concentrated on dye plants. It's a whole other talk on dye plants, but the dye plant collection has not been researched so far. Um, in three months' time, and Zoe, a wonderful student from York, has finished her placement at Kew, will have a much better handle on what we have in the dye collection. Yes, because there was a question about that. Yes, yeah, so good. Yeah. That's great. Um, I think. That seems to be all for the moment. Um, nobody else present would like to ask something? No, I think uh, it looks as if people really appreciated your talk though, Mark. It was absolutely fascinating. It went through rather quickly, so I wasn't able to take it all <laughs> in, but um, I would like to um, just say thank you very much for doing that. Um, and it has been, as I say, absolutely fascinating. And if people could get in touch with you, um, that would be wonderful as well for anybody yep. wanting to do further research. So thank you indeed very much, Mark, for doing that for us. And we shall follow with interest what is happening in Q, um, in your in your library. So that would be great. You